verse out there. Go ahead and open to Luke chapter 3. We're going to read, I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 22. And uh, if you weren't here last week, um, I preached the first six verses, so uh, they kind of go together. It reads, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Traconius, and Lysianus, uh, tetrarch of Albion, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain shall mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And the flesh, all flesh, shall see the salvation of God. And he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized to him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And when the axe is laid to the roots of the tree, therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to the one who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. The ten tax collectors also came to be baptized, and he said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect more than what is appropriate for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What and what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now as the people were in expectation, and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the weed into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above, and he shut John up into prison. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended into in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for Palm Sunday. We are thankful for the one that you sent, that he went to the cross in our place. That he not only went to the cross in our place, but that you buried him and resurrected him, and he is in glory, and he is waiting to come back. We pray that he would come back soon. But Lord, I pray that in the meantime, that we would be faithful to proclaim your son to the world. That we would proclaim the first coming of your Savior, that we'd proclaim Christ to the world. And Lord, we thank you that John the Baptist proclaimed Christ before he came. Matter of fact, he proclaimed a baptism of, of repentance for the remission of sins, that their hearts would be ready, that their hearts would be ready to receive the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. Lord, I pray that if there's some here today, Lord, that are not children of Abraham by faith, that they would become children of Abraham. That they would be the stones in which the Lord could open their hearts and cause repentance. And Lord, we pray that there would be much fruit 
in this local body. Lord, we see the fruit happening, but I pray, Lord, that, that we would have much fruit, that we would honor you. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in tune with what John is saying, that we would look at our own lives in respect to uh, true repentance, as he says, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, that we would look in our own lives and we would also look to the scriptures to see what does genuine conversion look like? And am I truly saved? Lord, I pray that you would bless uh, the preaching of your word, that you would hide your servant behind the cross, and that our hearts would be filled from hearing your word today. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As we looked at uh, John the preacher last week, I called him John the preacher or John the Baptist. Uh, um, in, in looking at John the preacher, um, Luke gives us the setting of what's going on in around the Jordan River. Um, there is the, the bridge to Christ, the man who is the one who was prophesied about that would come and, and be the, the one who would come and tell everybody the king was coming, the king being the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, there's a prophecy in Isaiah about this man, John the Baptist, and about how he is preaching um, a baptism of repentance and a remission of sins. And then in verse 6, it tells us, and all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. And what we see in our passage today is we see his message. We have a, a glimpse of some of his preaching. And uh, just to tell you, um, some of his preaching wouldn't fly in most churches today. Matter of fact, uh, some people probably ignore John the Baptist and what he preached about repentance or say, well, that was John's message. It's not even close to the same as Jesus' message. But actually, if you study uh, the Gospel of Matthew, when, he, when Jesus begins his ministry, he actually preaches repentance also. So to just kind of give you a breakdown of what we're going to be looking at today, um, first I would label this, what does false conversion look like? Because... He mentions these people that are coming, and they're, they're not truly saved. And then next, he, he talks about what does true conversion look like. And so he gets a different group of people that uh, probably don't understand it yet, that are probably not saved, but he's asking, they're asking, well, what does true conversion look like? And he, and he tells them what con true conversion looks like. And then lastly, we see that true conversion receives the Messiah, and um, as we see that Jesus is the bridge, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm sorry, John the Baptist is the bridge to Christ. What we see is in Acts and other places that when people have received John's message and are truly repentant in faith, they end up receiving who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we're past this, so we don't preach um, the baptism of, we don't preach um, John the Baptist, we preach Christ, right? So let's go ahead and look at our passage. What does false conversion look like? Look at verses 7 through 9. Look what he said. Then he said to the multitudes. So he's out in uh, around the Jordan River preaching. And so he, of course, is by a, a river because it says, and he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. And just for those who are infant Baptists, um, there's, there's, there's water here, right? There's a river. Anyway, just a, just a statement here. So he said, then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the roots of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Now notice that he tells them that they are a brood of vipers. They're coming out of the cities into this area to be baptized. And as we mentioned, this was out in the desert. So Matthew's account of the gospel account tells us that mainly these people that were coming, and there might have been more than just Pharisees and Sadducees, but they were mainly Pharisees and Sadducees. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 3, 7, it says, 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so um, if we were to go uh, around uh, Plain City or Ogden, we wouldn't necessarily meet very many people that would be called Pharisees and Sadducees, right? So here comes the question, who are the Pharisees and Sadducees? And I'll just kind of... Um, briefly explain who they are. Pharisees were seen as a religious group, uh, religious elites in Jerusalem. The word means to separate, and common people looked to them for answers. They believed in the Torah, and in addition to the Torah, they had 600 laws. So the Torah, of course, is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? And they also believed in their own 600 laws. As you can imagine, when somebody says, I believe the Bible, but I also believe this, uh, we run into trouble because when they say, I also believe this, it contradicts what? The word of God, right? And so um, they would follow the teachings of two rabbis or Jewish teachers. And, um, and so these men thought, well, we have these laws and we have the Torah and they hated the Romans, and the Pharisees said the Old Testament was inspired, but we also believe in these six-plus mandate, man-made laws. And so those 600-plus uh, laws were things that later Jesus um, combats, right, because they're adding to God's word. Now, also, the Sadducees believed, they were the other group, believed in a literal interpretation of Scripture. However, they denied the resurrection. Um, this group tended to be wealthy, and they were compliant with Roman laws, um, and sometimes dishonored the Bible to make their way into money. For example, the high priests were Sadducees, and they were crooks. So, so what we see here is both of these were false religions, and they were kind of affecting the people in Israel at the time, right? They were seen as false religion in John's comments to them, and Luke tells us that there was also other people that were coming with the wrong thinking. So uh, it's mostly Pharisees and Sadducees, but I would say here that there's multitudes. So obviously there would have been normal Jews also coming. So Luke mentions the other people, that the multitudes of other Jewish people. So they have wrong thinking about baptism. They have wrong thinking about salvation. And John says, you are an offspring of vipers. That's pretty harsh words, is it not? Um, that was saying that they are desert snakes. Um, you wouldn't say to somebody that you are trying to win their affection that they're a snake, right? Uh, snakes stink, right? Put them on your hands and they smell bad. And then the ones that you can't pick up, or if you try to pick up, they what? They bite you, right? And so... They're also, these desert snakes were small snakes, and they were deceptive. So sometimes people might think they're picking up a twig or a dead branch, and all of a sudden they got what? They get bit. I remember one time when I was in Arizona, and it was a little bit colder, and I'm walking um, on the sand, uh, and I almost, I stepped right over the top of a sidewinder. And I was like, Whoa. And I was thankful it was cold, but it looked like a branch there. Um, they're on the ground. And so, so we have example of Paul getting bit by a snake when he's gathering sticks right before he's headed to Rome, uh, when, well, when he's on his way to Rome. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them to the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And you remember that they thought he was a god because he doesn't fall over and what? die, right? And so, um, so this whole idea of being called a snake is a big deal. When we examine scripture, we see that Satan is called the deceiver, and he is called a serpent in scripture, right? So um, in Revelation 12, 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then, of course, Revelation 20, verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and bound him for a thousand years. 
And so as he's calling these people a brood of vipers, guess who their father is? Satan is their father. And these people are also Satan's people. And these people were coming to avoid judgment. Um, judgment that they thought that they could do some outward acts or that they could somehow um, not have their heart changed, right? A lot of people today think that they can be saved without God, what? Changing their hearts. So John asked, who warned you to flee from the wrath of God? Come. Why are you coming here? Why are you leaving Jerusalem and coming here and your heart is not changed? Now, before we talk about their motivation, what about this wrath? He speaks about a wrath here. He says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Um, wrath in scripture is upon every person until they trust in Christ. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2, it tells us, before we were saved, we were what? Children of wrath, right? You have to know the bad news before you understand the good news, right? Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the men, and were by nature what? Children of wrath, just as the others. So the Bible teaches that before somebody's saved, they are a child, children of wrath. The Bible also tells us that people are already under God's wrath even before they hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to John 3.18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so, so people are already condemned because they're in a sinful, rebellious state. So unto redeemed men are not just condemned already. There is also an outpouring of God's wrath and a future judgment. Um, scripture teaches that there is a literal hell and that hell is a place for people who don't receive who? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? And also, John makes it clear that someone who does receive the Lord Jesus Christ or is a true follower of Yahweh in the Old Testament, their heart's going to be what? Change their desires, their thinking is going to be changed. So listen to this in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And if you look at this verse, um, he says, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's not saying work salvation. He's saying if there's an inward change, then somebody's going to want to honor who? The Lord, because the Holy Spirit lives in them. So the point is that without genuine conversion, you can't escape God's wrath. No matter how many prayers you pray, no matter if you're baptized, no matter if you... If you walk to the altar, no matter if you pray, no matter, uh, no matter what, unless your heart is changed inside, it's not true repentance. And we, of course, looked at Judas last week. Judas had a repentance that was a worldly repentance, right? And, of course, Judas perished. So look what he says. He says, true repentance bears fruit. Uh, a true change of heart, a true change of thinking bears fruit. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of fruits worthy of repentance. So listen to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you will know them by what? Their fruits. Does it say you will know them by their, their special acts? What does it say? By their fruits. He says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So he's telling us that an unbeliever is always going to produce what? That, not, that which is not from God, right? The believer is going to produce fruit that is from God, verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down 
and thrown in the fire, therefore by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so his point here is not work salvation, obviously. For by faith you've been saved, I mean, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, right? But what we do see is true salvation will result in what? Fruit. There's internal change. Good fruit is from the tree or bad fruit is from the tree. Now, I don't want you to think about this. I got an orchard of fruit. Uh, well, I have an orchard of uh, fruit trees. And sometimes they bear fruit and sometimes they don't. So what if someone, what if one year I didn't have fruit on my trees and somebody was so kind and went down to Kent's Market over here, because it's not very far, and they bought a bunch of apples and they felt bad for me. And so they took some fishing line and, and a needle and strung them all together and put them all over the tree, kind of like Maybe we do like with popcorn and stuff, or they used to, and we do it during Christmas or whatever. Um, how long would that fruit look good if it was like 95 degrees outside and there was apples all over my apple tree? How long would it look good for? A few days, right? Well, why would it look bad after a while? Because that's just what? Outward, it's not inward. It's not being produced from what? From the tree, right? Jesus actually tells the Pharisees later that they need to cut to clean the inside of what? The cup and not just simply the outside of the cup. So the fruit might look nice for a few days, but over time, if the fruit is not connected to the tree, if it's not connected to the roots, it will result in being rotten real quick. So notice the Holy Spirit changes the person. And we mentioned last week that repentance is something, according to Scripture, that the Lord grants, right? The Lord grants repentance. So notice in Paul's writing, he says the fruit singular. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this is very important because notice that fruit is singular and fruit comes from the work of God. Listen to this. In Galatians 5, through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So notice that Paul, that not Paul, but John says, John the Baptist, John the preacher says, you guys are coming out, you scribes and Pharisees, and what nationality are they? We're in Israel, they're all mainly Jewish people, right? There, of course, is soldiers there, so there's some non-Jewish people there. But he's speaking to these Jewish people that think that somehow that because they've been raised in a Jewish home, and some people today think because they've been raised in a Christian family or a Christian subculture, that somehow by coming from that family, they're naturally just what? They're saved and they're okay. So John says you can't trust in your family your upbringing, or your family nationality. Look what he says in verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves. Don't say this to yourselves. What are they not to say to themselves? We have Abraham as our father. Now, I want you to realize this. Salvation has never been connected to your nationality. Matter of fact, in Romans, he makes this clear to the Jewish people. He says, you know, you Jews are sinners also, but I want you to know the one benefit that you did have is you had the oracles of God, meaning that they had the Old Testament what? In their hands. And it was through the Jewish nation that the prophets came. So salvation has never been connected to your nationality. It's just kind of like Thomas had said that there was uh, a salvation to the Gentiles, to everybody. However, that does not save you. Abraham is the father of the Jews, yet Abraham is a different kind of father to all who believe. Only to those who believe. Listen to, to this. Now, obviously, there's a promise for Israel, but the focus here is he's saying that unless somebody's a child of faith, they're not going to inherit what? The king of God. Um, listen to Romans 4, 16 and 17. It says, therefore, it is a faith 
that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, that of course is the Jews, but, to the, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which did not exist, do not exist as though they did. So you notice here that you become a child of God through what? Through faith, through believing. So throughout generations, people have associated themselves with other people, buildings, synagogues, physical church buildings, only sadly to perish. And the closer you are to the truth without personally receiving it, you receive a greater condemnation. And John says, God can, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And that fits that Romans 4, 16 and 17 that says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which did not exist as though they did. So he's saying, your genealogy will not get you into heaven. And really it is God who is able to get someone into heaven. And here John is probably talking about the stones because it is God who changes the heart. And if you would read the Old Testament, you would find that there's passages in the Old Testament that speak about the heart of stone. For example, in Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And, if it, and this doesn't take very much uh, brain power, but if I picked up a big, huge stone and I, and it was pretty solid and threw it at you, you would probably duck. Why? Because it's pretty hard, right? And so people are born with hard what? Hard hearts. And God has to change those hearts. So the passage speaks of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, radically changed heart by Almighty God. And since they're not coming with the right heart for repentance, John says that judgment is here and will soon completely take you out. So look at verse 9, what he says here in John 3, I mean in Luke 3, verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree, roots of the trees, therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now today we usually use chainsaws, right? I don't see very many people out there with an ax. Unless you don't have gas and you didn't bring your chainsaw and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you, you know, you're just like, you know, maybe camping or something. Um, and so this, of course, would cut down the tree at the bottom. Here he says, at the root, clear down where the tree gets its life. And all the trees that don't bear fruit will be taken down. And look at the imagery here. They're thrown what? In the fire. Now, I want you to sit, notice this. That unbelievers can fool the church. They can fool pastors. They can fool others. But they can't fool who? They can't fool God. And really, Scripture teaches that there's always some that are part of the body throughout history, but that they don't know the Lord. And God is the one that removes them. Listen to what Jesus says on this subject in Matthew 13, 28 through 30. He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, no, at least while you gather up the tares, it's tares in the wheat, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but rather the wheat into, the, into my barn. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, we've got to ask the question is, do I really know the Lord? Um, I don't want to be the one who's associated with the church that doesn't have a personal what? Relationship with the Lord. I don't want to be the one who was raised like the Jewish person that was a leader that thought he was saved and not be saved. And so 
John is addressing their hearts. He's a prophet, so he's able to know their hearts. We don't know each other's hearts in the same way because we're not what? We're not prophets, and of course, we're not the all-knowing God, right? And so John's getting his information from who? From the Holy Spirit, from God, right? So that's the first question. What does false conversion look like? And you guys saw that. Well, Paul, I mean, not Paul. I don't know why I keep on going back to Colossians and talking about Paul. Uh, Paul wrote so much of the New Testament, but Luke actually wrote more. So what does true conversion look like? Uh, verses 10 through 14, actually. I actually messed up on that. So, so true repentance bears fruit. So he asks, he says that in verse 8. He says, uh, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. He talks about these scribes, uh, these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. And now there's other people here that are coming to John's baptism. And a lot of them are outcasts. Isn't that interesting? In America, so many people have made the church. So it's just about a bunch of rules and people. And then they don't understand that Jesus called all men to repentance, and he went to the, some of the most wicked people. You know, Jesus would have been calling, Jesus called everybody to repentance. He'd be calling uh, the moralists in our country that think, well, because I'm a moralist and I vote morally, but they don't have a changed heart, and he would also be calling the LGBTQ community to repentance, and he would be calling all men to repentance if he was still here. So notice that... Um, his preaching seemed to make some of them wonder, am I saved? Um, as, as you can imagine, if somebody was out in the wilderness and, and they're um, dressed the way that John the Baptist was dressed, right? Um, camel's hair and eating locusts. And he's out in the middle of the desert. It would be kind of strange, right, to see that? And then hearing him say that God's judgment is coming would make you ask, am I, am I saved? I was here to get baptized, but I realized that maybe I need to truly repent. I'm interested in being that tree that is not burned up in the fire. And really, if you don't know the Lord, you should, be, you should not be wanting to be that tree, right? Look at verse 10. So the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? What does true repentance look like? Is what he's really saying. Look at verses 11 through 14 here. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to the one who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. And likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not, be, do not intimidate anyone or Accuse falsely and be content with your wages. So notice that there are three groups of people that John answers. He says, this is what repentance looks like in each of these three groups. So if you have a changed heart, this is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to desire to do. So notice that he mentions the people from the crowd. He says, give away a tunic. And none of you and I, none of us are wearing tunics today, right? So I guess if we want to be biblical, maybe we should wear tunics. No, I'm just teasing. Um, and so none of us have tunics today, but a tunic was both for males and females wore tunics, and it was under the outer garment. And it would help you from the cold. So some had many tunics and, and help others who do not. Uh, it's really kind of interesting because sometimes we are so spoiled in our country in the sense of all the resources we have that even if you're poor, we really don't understand what poverty was like in Jesus' time, right? So notice that this is a personal thing and not a government thing. So, so when somebody comes along and says, well, we should institute this in the government. No, this isn't a government thing. This is what? A personal thing. So it's voluntarily from the heart. Maybe a natural disaster, people need food, housing, and clothing. So he says that they're to take their tunic, if they have an extra one, and give it to those who are cold and are shivering 
and they need help. And notice the next people he talks about is the tax collectors. And these were people, uh, tax farmers, who had paid some money to Rome to collect taxes. As you notice that uh, when uh, Luke begins this area in chapter 3, he mentions in verse 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of who? Tiberius Caesar. So Rome is over Israel, and Rome is over all of Israel, Pontius Pilate, Herod, Philip, and so Rome is all over everything. And you know what? Rome really liked Jewish people's money, right? Just like any rulers. Rulers like your service and like your money. So the Romans had to find a way, of course, to get the money from the Jewish people. So they had these people called tax farmers who had paid some money to Rome to collect taxes. So they, they, they paid to be an IRS agent. Um, but these people were worse than the IRS, okay? All right? All right. We have to say that at Liberty Bible Church here. So, um, and they would collect taxes on imports and exports. And there were tax offices in Caesarea, Capernaum, and Jericho. And they're pretty close to Jericho, and which was pretty close to where John is preaching. And the tax farmers would have chief publicans who they would employ to gather to the gathering of their taxes. So you know how it works. You got this, you got the big dogs, and then you have these guys, and then you, you know, on down the list, right? So an example is in Luke 19.2, uh, with Zacchaeus, um, Zacchaeus the little man, right? Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was what? He's rich. Very important that he adds that in there. He was rich. Well, why was he rich? Because he was a tax collector, and they exhorted people, extorted people, and so some of these men were extortionists. And they would fleece people and take more than they would than they should, and Jewish people saw them as traitors. You shouldn't even be out here getting baptized, you wicked people. You shouldn't, get, you shouldn't even be offered salvation, is what a lot of the Pharisees and Sadducees would have thought. And um, these people knew that what they were doing, and their conscience was going to getting to them. So John says, true repentance will start, of course, in your heart, but you will, what will it look like? You'll collect no more than what is appointed for you. So I want you to think about that. Why would they not collect more than what is appointed? Because if they have a heart change, who are they going to be obedient to? The Lord, right? So they ain't going to fleece people because they know that their, that their audience is the one audience. You will be exact in what you are to collect. And if you guys remember the story of Zacchaeus, he says, I'm going to pay back um, all those people multiple amounts compared to what I took, if that's the case. Because his, and, and Jesus says, salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. Notice he also mentions the military or the soldiers. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. And some of you who have went overseas with the military and been in combat, you could, you could probably sometimes intimidate people, um, you know, whether you get away with it or not, by just being a military person overseas with some of the people there. People might take things from them. But at this time, the soldiers would result uh, to torturing people at times, and sometimes they would get money for the Roman government, and they would also take more for themselves. So what John is saying is that this repentance, this baptism of repentance is unto the Lord and it changes what? The heart and the desires and it will result in whatever area of life you are. So obviously, uh, you know, a doctor's profession is different than, say, an electrician or, or whatever, but, but you would want to be honest in what you're doing in your profession because your heart is changed. So a Christian's heart should be generous to others. All three groups here is generosity here. 
And um, why? Because God was generous to us. In return, the Christian is to be generous to others. And I just want to remember, mention again, um, when it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Goodness could be translated as generous. Or there's a generosity. Uh, there's an outflowing of generosity from the Christian because God has been so generous to us in salvation. So, this third thing John preaches here is he is the bridge of Christ. He says, uh, basically I said this, that true conversion will what? Embrace Christ. Remember, John the Baptist is the bridge. And they're all expecting the Messiah. Um, look at verses 15 through 17. Now as the people were in expectation. And notice, and all reason their hearts about John. Like, they're trying to figure out this guy. His camel's hair, he's in the desert, he's preaching this other thing. It's not all about being a Jew, it's about repentance, it's about seeing my own sin. Remember we mentioned that baptism for the Jewish person was usually for who? The Romans and the Greeks? It wasn't for what? For Jewish people because they didn't see themselves as sinful. So John's baptism is for all sinners. So now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered saying, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in the hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So notice that uh, these people, a lot of them are deluded have been deluded with false teaching. You know, they've been in Jerusalem and around the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, they've been in, say, Utah today. And they haven't heard somebody being preaching the true gospel that you or me are going to go out and preach, right? And they're, they have this false thinking. They know that there's a Messiah. And so their thoughts and their hearts is, John the Messiah, is he the one the Old Testament predicted? And we all know that he is a forerunner, but the Jewish people here don't know. And truly, before Jesus came, they were, there were, there was an expectation of who the Messiah is. And they looked to try to understand who John is. Listen to John. In John 1, 19 through 27, he gives us some commentary. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am what? Not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? And he said, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent with, with were, were from the Pharisees, excuse me, and they answered and asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered and saying to them, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. So John is the forerunner. John is the bridge. So who is the Messiah? Now notice that the word baptism, uh, if you were to look in the Greek, means to immerse. And Messiah will baptize you, but not with water, but with what? Spirit and fire. We find out that Jesus is, after Jesus' life, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection, the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes to the church and Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. Remember that? 
um, in Acts chapter 2. I don't have time to go there, but in Acts chapter 2. And it also teaches us that Jesus adds to his church through the Holy Spirit in Matthew 16, 18. But I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the Messiah builds the church. And what does the Holy Spirit do after the work of Christ? So when we're thinking about this baptism that Jesus is going to give, it's the Holy Spirit's spiritual baptism. Water never changes a person's heart. You know, it makes me sad how many people have thought that they were saved through just water baptism when they didn't have what? A changed heart. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, how many spirits? One spirit, the Holy Spirit, all baptized into how many bodies? One body, whose body? Christ, right? Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And uh, just to kind of give you some ideas here, remember what, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3. He tells us the Holy Spirit causes new life. In John 3, 3 through 6, uh, in his conversation to Nicodemus. Remember, they're having a discussion. Nicodemus is one of the teachers of Israel, and he doesn't get it. And Jesus tells him that you have to be born again. Listen to this in John 3, 3 through 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is... Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So it has to be the spirit that causes what? Regeneration, a new life. A new heart. And notice the Holy Spirit indwells believers. In John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus says this, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, knows him but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And notice also the Holy Spirit seals the believer, and Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantor of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Another thing about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit ministers through prayer. In Romans 8, 16, and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children with heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so uh, when we see this, he says that, that Jesus is going to baptize people with what? With the Holy Spirit and fire. So true salvation is through faith, by, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is what? A gift of God. At least anyone should boast. But it's this work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit regenerates people and brings about new life. And that's what John the Baptist is speaking about here. In verse 16, John answered, saying, Though I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I want you guys to understand something here. Uh, Genesis 15, 6 and other places in the Old Testament tells us the people were saved through faith. Through repenting of their sins and trusting in God's righteousness. But of course, in the New Testament... Jesus is the fulfillment of God's righteousness, meaning that he is the substitute, right? So as John is calling these people to repentance, can they be saved before Jesus comes? 
Absolutely, because they're saved through faith, right? But that faith will what? Will work. Why will it work? Is it because we work for salvation? No, because if that is a true faith, your heart's going to be changed and you're going to want to what? Honor the Lord because the Holy Spirit's done that work in you. I hope this makes sense to you as we're looking at John's um, re- baptism of repentance. Now notice that um, John also says the Messiah is the judge. And here John gives the illustration of a farm work in the first century when grain was taken from the field. It was put on a hard floor that was flat and then they would throw it in the air and the chaff would blow away leaving the wheat. Right? That's why he speaks of this winnowing fan. Look at verse 17. And his winnowing fan is in hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So he keeps the wheat, that is the true converted souls, and the chaff that leaves and blows will end up being what? Burned. And in the end of Matthew, in Matthew 25, 41, this is what Jesus says, and he will, then he, will add, he will also say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And if you notice here, John is speaking here, That the one who's coming, that of course is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will ultimately clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but his chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And this is the thing, is either people can bow to the Messiah in this life, or they will ultimately have to bow to them when he die, or when he comes back, right? Right? Every person will ultimately bow to the Messiah. And remember, in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, it tells us that he is the judge. It says, and that in the name of Jesus, how many knees should bow? Every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, those are the ones we don't see, right? Glorifying. And of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So, um, one thing to take note of, since we looked at this passage, is John tells us what repentance looks like. He helps us understand true repentance. Um, If you want to know what repentance looks like in salvation, John is saying that it's a change of heart that will result in a change of action. It's right here. Don't be like some people and say, Well, we just have to ignore what John the Baptist says. No, every word of God is what? Inspired. And Jesus didn't preach a different message than John the Baptist. He doesn't come along and say, oh, goodbye repentance, that was for John. No, Jesus and John both taught repentance. As I mentioned to you in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus begins his ministry, In John chapter 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John helps us understand true repentance. And John's baptism shows what true salvation looks like. And if a person's heart is changed inside out. And then he also mentions Jesus' baptism is with Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, the baptism that's more than just water. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a change of heart. And also he mentions that Jesus is the judge, right? John speaks about judgment, but he ultimately says that that judgment's going to be carried out by the Lord Jesus Christ in the second coming, right? Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, as we come to you, I pray, Lord, that that every one of us has come to a true repentance, a repentance that's not something that's just 
words, but it would be in our hearts, Lord, that it would be a true repentance unto salvation. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that, they, that you would grant them repentance and they would trust in you. And Lord, um, Lord, I pray that um, that we would just thank you for your son. We thank you that his baptism was of the Holy Spirit and that we couldn't change ourselves. We were like leopards that tried to change their spots or like the Ethiopian that can't change his color, Lord, that it was you that had to change our hearts. Lord, we pray that um, we would seek to tell others about Christ, that we would use this, what the world calls Easter and we call Resurrection Sunday. Lord, I pray that we would preach Christ to others, Lord, as as John the Baptist was a preacher of righteousness, Lord, I pray that we would be a preacher of righteousness this week. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen.